Hello. Welcome, friends. This is A Course in Miracles, Palm Beach Study Group. Today we're on um, Chapter 14, Section 6, The Light of Communication. The journey that we undertake together is the exchange of dark for light, of ignorance for understanding. Nothing you understand is fearful. It is only in darkness and in ignorance that you perceive the frightening and shrink away from it to further darkness. And yet it is only the hidden that can be that can terrify, not for what it is, but for its hiddenness. The obscure is frightening because you do not understand its meaning. If you did, it would be clear and you would be no longer in the dark. Nothing has hidden value, for what is hidden cannot be shared, and so its value is unknown. The hidden is kept apart, but value always lies in joint appreciation. What is concealed cannot be loved, and so it must be feared. So the exchange for, of dark for light is the exchange of ego for spirit. Of ignorance for understanding is the exchange of ego for spirit. Nothing you understand, so in other words, understanding is spirit, so nothing in spirit is fearful. It is only in darkness, it is only in the ego that you perceive frightening. And when you do, you shrink away into further darkness, further into the ego. And yet it is only the ego, which is the hidden, that can terrify not for what it is, but for its hiddenness, for its, its illusion, its dream reality. The obscure is frightening. The ego is frightening because you don't understand its meaning. But of course, it has no meaning, so you can't understand it. And it has no value and it can't be shared, so it has no knowledge. So what is concealed, what is ego, cannot be loved, and so it must be feared. Paragraph two. The quiet light in which the Holy Spirit dwells within you is merely perfect oneness in which nothing is hidden and therefore nothing is fearful. Attack will always yield to love if it is brought to love, not hidden from it. There is no darkness that the light of love will not dispel unless it is concealed from love's benefits, beneficists. What is kept apart from love cannot, be, cannot share its healing power because it has been separated off and kept in darkness. The sentinels of darkness watch over it carefully. And you who made these guardians of illusion out of nothing, are now afraid of them. So we're reminded that we created the ego. We created the guardians of illusion. 
when we are afraid of our own creation of ego. But the first part is very clear. Holy Spirit dwells within you and Holy Spirit is perfectly open and therefore nothing in spirit is fearful. Any comments, questions? Paragraph three. Would you continue to give imagined power to these strange ideas of safety? They are neither safe nor unsafe. They do not protect, neither do they attack. They do nothing at all, being nothing at all. As guardians of darkness and of ignorance look to them only for fear, for what they keep obscure is fearful, but let them go, and what was fearful will be no longer. Without protection of obscurity, only the light of love remains, for only this has meaning and can live in light. Everything else must disappear. And the disappearance of the ego is based upon just letting it go. We've been taught over and over again by the Course that we are spiritual beings and you know we're as bright as the sun shining its light. And the only thing that that's keeping us in darkness is is holding on to the ego ideas. Let them go, and they'll just dissipate. Turn the light on in the dark room, and the darkness won't be there anymore. The darkness is just an illusion. Paragraph four. Death yields to life simply because destruction is not true. The light of guiltlessness shines guilt away because when they are brought together, the truth of one must make the falsity of its opposite perfectly clear. Keep not guilt and guiltlessness apart. For your belief that you can have them both is meaningless. All you have done by keeping them apart is lose their meaning by confusing them with each other. And so you do not realize that only one means anything. The other is wholly without sense of any kind. So only the spirit makes sense. The ego makes no sense whatsoever. It is actually insane. It has no sense. And this kind of describes somebody who's got one foot in the spirit world and one foot in the ego world and is is, is sitting there on the fence and kind of going back and forth, you know, and not having made up their mind to to completely let the ego go. And um, it said, keep not guilt and guiltlessness apart. If you believe in both of them, that's meaningless. You need to choose. Any comments, questions? John, I, I don't I, I don't I don't understand that a hundred percent. Keep not guilt and guiltlessness apart. It's so keep not guilt right. guiltlessness apart. So if I'm not keeping guilt apart from guiltlessness, that means I'm it's a one entity. Is that well, 
All right. Well, I, it is kind of confusing the way it's worded. And the rest of the sentence is, for your belief that you can have them both is meaningless. And that's basically what it is. In other words, you can't have both the spiritual world and the ego world at the same time. Okay. You know, that's that's the gist of it. You know, you have to decide. It's one or the other. You can't have them both. If you have them, if you're trying to have them both, you've really got ego because you're stuck in the ego. You haven't fully committed to the spirit. Only when you fully commit to the spirit can you completely let the ego go. And then you've done it. You've turned the light on in the dark room. But as, as long as you think, well, um, I'll forgive them, but I'm still mad at them. Okay. You know, that's, you, you can't do that. Okay. If you're still mad at them, then you haven't really forgiven them. Because if you've really forgiven them, you've loved them, then you're going to love them, not still be angry at them. Okay. I was thinking a little differently in the, in, in the sense of um, my practice in life is to be in spirit. I've committed to God. I've made that commitment, you know, and recommitted over and over again. But sometimes I drift into ego world because of past experiences and things that I'm trying to unsort or sort out, if you will. And that's what I that's what I was confused about. So thank you for clarifying that. Yes, and that happens to all of us. Because we have not fully made the transition. We're all still Human. students on the on the path, you know we're we're transitioning um and so we try to stay in spirit when something happens and it jolts us back into ego the the important thing is that as soon as we become conscious of it that we use our free will to turn back to spirit so somebody who's like 99% spirit uh, ego and only 1% spirit. But if they start looking towards spirit, then they start becoming 2% spirit, then 5% spirit. And, then, and then eventually you get to 50% both ways. And then you, you as long as you keep on the path, You'll do 60%, 70%, 80% until you finally get to the 100%. But it's a gradual process. So, you know, you have to give yourself time and be gentle with yourself and be kind to yourself and give, give uh, understanding to yourself and just, you know, be vigilant and and when you do find yourself in ego thought, as soon as you become conscious of it, say, oh, nope, I crossed the line again. Let's get back to spirit. Let's forgive. Let's love. Let's let's drop the anger. Let's drop, drop the hate, the selfishness, whatever it is that, that you cross the line into. Let it go. Just let that go. And eventually, you'll you'll get to the hundred percent. And in the process of moving on the path and getting towards that goal, the hundred percent, if you will, as being the goal, um, you know, there's there's a lot going on inside of us. You know, we're releasing. What doesn't we're releasing the ego a little at a time. That's why we have room to move on and be more spiritual because we've let a lot of that go. And also committing to staying on that path, make a commitment. I think that I wonder, I don't know, but for me it was important to always commit to that 
path, it seems to give me a little focus that I can stay on it. And I know that it's right for me. Yes, you have to make that commitment. Most definitely. Okay, thanks, John. But try to think in terms of it. Try to think more in terms of it's, uh, it's like instead of thinking of letting the ego go, think of embracing the light. Every gotcha. day I want to embrace the light more and more and more. If you do that, then you don't have to worry about letting go of the ego because the more of the light that you embrace, the more of the love, the forgiveness that you embrace, the the ego automatically dissipates. It just it just goes by the wayside. You don't. That's that's why um, you know it. It says death yields to life simply. That's what the first sentence of paragraph four. Death yields, yields to life simply. Just keep it simple. Just keep embracing the light and love and forgiveness. And that's you keep focused on that. And you don't have to worry about letting the ego go. Okay. All righty then. So, uh, paragraph five. You have regarded the separation as a means for breaking your communication with your father. The Holy Spirit reinterprets it as a means of reestablishing what was not broken but has been made obscure. All things you made have use to him. For his, for most, for his most holy purpose. Let me say that again. All things you have made, all things you made have use to him for his most holy purpose. He knows you are not separated from God, but he perceives much in your mind that lets you think you are. All this and nothing else would he separate from you. The power of decision which you made in place of the power of creation, he would teach you how to use on your behalf. You who made it to crucify yourself must learn of him how to apply it to the holy cause of restoration. And to put that whole paragraph in a thimble, it's simply saying that the Holy Spirit uses ego experiences to teach you how to get back to spirit. So every opportunity for love and forgiveness comes from an ego situation. And that's how that's how we learn. We learned from our our the ego situations that we find ourselves in. And and by releasing them and turning to the light, to the love, to the forgiveness, we learn how to embrace the spirit and thus release the ego. So these are learning situations. Paragraph six, you who speak in dark and devious symbols do not understand the language you have made. It has no meaning. 
for its purpose is not communication, but rather the disruption of communication. If the purpose of language is communication, how can this tongue mean anything? Yet even this strange and twisted effort to communicate through not communicating holds enough of love to make it meaningful if its interpreter is not its maker. You who made it are but expressing conflict from which the Holy Spirit would release you. Leave what you would communicate to him. He will interpret it to you with perfect clarity, for he knows with whom you are in perfect communication. Again, just allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. So if, if to substitute the, the love for the hatred, to substitute the forgiveness for the anger, learn how to communicate in, in spiritual terms, being helpful and kind. Holy Spirit will help you with all of this if you but let him and ask for his guidance and listen, go into the silence and listen. If you have a problem, meditate on it instead of twisting it around and around in your mind, trying to figure out a solution. That's the, the wrong way to, to deal with the ego things that come up. The proper way is to just sit with it in silence and ask Holy Spirit to guide you. You'll, you'll be given the thoughts that you need to think to, to sort it out and to turn it around. Number seven, you know not what you say, and so you know not what is said to you. Let your interpreter, yet your interpreter perceives the meaning in your alien language. He will not attempt to communicate the meaningless but he will separate out all that has meaning, dropping off the rest and offering your true communication to those who would communicate as truly with you. You speak two languages at once and this must lead to unintelligibility. Yet if one means nothing, and the other everything, only that one is positive for purposes of communication. The other, the other but interferes with it. So he, he's speaking to somebody who's, you know, steeped in the ego thinking when he says, you know not what you say. It's, you know not what you say if you're steeped in the ego thinking. And so you don't know what's being said to you. So in other words, uh, an example is somebody who's angry and they speak angry words at you and blah, blah, blah. And remember what we've been taught in the, in the past of, by the course. So when you hear something like that, if you're listening with ego ears, you're going to hear anger and fear, and you're going to want to retaliate and punch him in the nose and what have you. But if you're hearing with spiritual ears the same communication, you're hearing a cry for help. And your response is going to be love and forgiveness. 
So that's what, what they're they're getting at here. If you're in the ego, you know not what you say and you don't know what's being said to you. To the ego ears, it, it sounds like anger. To the spiritual ears, it's a cry for help. Questions, comments? That's a good explanation, John. Thank you. So our last paragraph, number eight. The Holy Spirit's function is entirely communication. He therefore must remove whatever interferes with communication in order to restore it. Therefore, keep no source of interference from his sight, for he will not attack your sentiments, but bring them to him and let his gentleness teach you that in the light they are not fearful and cannot serve to guard the dark doors behind which nothing at all is carefully concealed. We must open all doors and let the light come streaming through. There are no hidden chambers in God's temple. Its gates are open wide to greet his son. No one can fail to come where God has called him if he chooses not the door himself upon his father's welcome. Oh, if he closed, I'm sorry. If he, no one can fail to come where God has called him if he closed not the door himself upon his father's welcome. We close our own, we close the doors to the father's wel welcome uh, ourselves by, by ego thinking. That's how we close those doors. But from God's point of view, those doors are always open to us. Yes, Helen. No, I, I, I'm good. Okay. So sentence four, bring, but bring them to him. In other words, bring all of your ego problems to him and to the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. So you're not going some other place. You're just going within. You bring those ego problems to Holy Spirit within you. And his gentleness will teach you in the light how to deal with them without fear and without darkness. And thus we come to the end of our reading for today. Any questions, comments? Again, thank you very much, John, for for reading. You're welcome. And explaining. All righty, then let's have a moment of silence and we'll stop our recording. <laughs> 